a pastor here ventured into the deep waters of Torah with his people. I mean the whole thing. I think he said he's up to Second Chronicles now, which is, which is glorious. But to have gone all the way through Torah is really important. Why? Let me ask you this. When do you honestly come to know a person? After you're married about five years. Five years? Five. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that's long enough. Actually, I think the key, I mean, if you knew William Wheaton was born in Bethesda, Maryland on October 4th in 1960, you don't know anything about me. Right? The stuff that we fill encyclopedias with, that's, that's, that's not how you know a person. How you come to know a person is when you know their stories. Every one of you has stories. And if you're honest, you'll note that your stories shape and change as the years pass. Right? But your kids or your wife, or your friends. When you start one of the stories, they can almost say it along with you. You are known by your stories. If you want to know God, you must know his stories. And above all, the stories in Torah. Because these are the foundational stories by which Jesus and the apostles, everyone, understood themselves, their world, and above all, this strange God who delights in calling things to be out of nothingness. It all works by learning the stories. How well we know the stories, then, is absolutely key for for telling the stories. And, and you've heard of the skyscraper sermons. Nothing but one story on top of another. And, and people like them. Why? Because people like to hear a story. President May gave us an absolutely fitting, perfect story. Very vivid, very real. You held it in your mind. You might have had, uh, immediately I thought of in a time when I got left behind in Washington, D.C. as a teenager. I, it's the same and waiting, 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 waiting. Are they going to come back? They didn't come back. I had to call mom and dad, come get me, I remember. And, and, and the, story, the story fit, it, you know, it, it, it was of peace. But the greatest stories that we get to tell are not the stories that are from our own lives, although that's important. But the greatest stories we tell are the stories of the people of God. And when you tell the scriptures as story, the people really do have it written down in their hearts and minds in a, in a very profound, living way. Let me deal with one of my favorite ones. It's one of those tech... <laughs> All my favorite passages have question marks around them. Uh, it, it floats around in John chapter 8, sometimes in Luke. It doesn't show up in our pericopal system. One or three, I don't think. The story of the woman caught in what? In, how did he put it? The very act. Now, wait a minute. Last time I checked on the very act of adultery, there might have been two people involved, right? At least, these days. Um, but, 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 but two, and they find one, and they drag her off to him. How do you know John's telling what he saw? C.S. Lewis commented on this particular pericope, and he said, if he's not giving you an eyewitness account, this is the first example we have in literature of the creation of verisimilitude 
before the 17th century. They bring her to Jesus and they say, they got their stones ready. What do they say? What do they say? Teacher, Moses says we can do it. Moses says we can kill her because we caught her in the very act of adultery. And then what does Jesus do? And what's the point of that in the narrative? The, go back and read in time, and you, you hear the church fathers ruminating. What is this writing on the sand? What's he doing down there? Some people have guessed. Some people thought he would look at you, and he would think of the biggie in your life, and he would write out that commandment. And then he'd look at you, and he'd think out the biggie in your life, and he'd write that commandment down. Maybe. Augustine had a weird idea about it. To move from the law written on hearts of stone to the law written on hearts of living flesh to love. He is plowing new ground, breaking up stony ground. He's preparing to write the law of love in their hearts. But to do that, he has to speak a hard word of law. So he stands up and he says, all right, kill her. Only the one of you who doesn't have any sin, that one, gets to throw the stone first. And you have this glorious detail. Do you remember what it is? Say it. Beginning from the oldest, you're going to hear the stones dropping all around the courtyard. And finally, the young hotheads who don't want to admit that they've got it finally are shamed into admitting, yeah, I'm a sinner too. And they drop their stones. But every last one of them blows it. Why do they blow it? Because having terrified consciences at that point, they turn and run away. And so the last word they hear from Jesus is one of law. Where should they have run? Hmm? To her. To have stood with her and have said, I too am guilty of death. And then the last word they would have heard from Jesus is, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? No one, Lord. Neither do I condemn you. Go, sin no more. This is important. People say, wait a minute, that ended on a word of law. Did it? It ended in freedom. Because freedom is not being able to do whatever you want to do. People think that's freedom. Did the prodigal son think that was freedom? Hey, Dad, I can't stand all these rules. I just, give me the money. I wish you were dead. Let, let me go my own way. And what happened when he went his own way and did whatever he wanted? He ended up slave. Slave to his own appetites and desires. When he says to her, I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. He's setting her into the gift of freedom. But how can he do it? How can he take Moses? How can he take very clear Torah and toss it away? Who else was going to stand where the woman stands? He was. Yeah. The only thing I would maybe question is whether it's right to say this isn't any of the law, or if it's rather that the way we think about the law is not full enough, that the law is fulfilled in Christ in such a way that the law no longer condemns us, but rather describes the life that is 
is no R, it's the, the, the way that, 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 that Dr. Nagel tried to get at this, and I still think it's one of the most brilliant things he ever said, he, he wondered if we ever should have allowed ourselves to think in terms of the third use of the law, which still leaves it under the category of law, or if we should have talked about the gospel's use of the law when the law comes back around as gift, when its condemnation is answered for. He is going to die for her, like for all the people there that were ready to stone him. He's going to die for them all. And this, is set, this sets them free. And it sets them free from the sin that they wanted to be part of. Now they're set free from that. They're set free and lifted up into the dignity of being a child of God, the dignity of their sonship. I, this, this really sets a person free. When, when not only do you not think of your others as an object, but you will not let yourself be treated as an object anymore. You're a person loved by God, even to the point of his own death. I don't think she knew that yet. But I think she did before it was over. Yeah. The desire I have, like, okay, let's say somebody turns away because of the law and those, and those uh, people abusing it. My desire is always to run after them and to share with them the gospel. And yet, apparently, they were. Yeah, I mean, you, 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 you can't read it without the pain of it. You, you read, you read the, the story of, uh, of the rich young ruler, right? Yeah. <laughs> Master, what do I have to do to have eternal life? And he's like, why are you calling me good? The one who's good? And he says, you know the commandments? Do them. And, 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 and the kid he honestly thinks he has. Do you remember the detail Mark asked? And he looked at him and loved him. And because he loved him, he had to show him that he hadn't kept even the first of the commandments. Oh, you've kept them all. Good. Then go. Sell everything you have. Give it all away to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven. Come, follow me. And what does Mark say? <coughs> he went away sorrowful because he had much wealth. Many of us have gone away sorrowful. But Jesus didn't say as he was walking away, wait a minute, you know, I was only using the law, man. Let me keep, come back, let me give you the gospel. He let him go. But in the church's tradition, do you know who it is? It's the one telling the story. It's Mark. It's Mark, the one who had the rich mommy in Jerusalem, where there was the upper room. Right? This is John Mark, who couldn't quite stick it out on that first big missionary trip. And St. Paul didn't have much patience with him. Right? Who would you want at your dinner table? Barnabas or Paul? I mean, Paul would probably be more entertaining, but Barnabas would be more comfortable. The, the son of encouragement, right? And he said, give him a chance. Paul's like, nope. He sold out on the gospel, I'm done with him. He wouldn't. Well, <laughs> Paul was a whole hogger. It, it was all or nothing. That's how he lived his life in Judaism, and that aspect of his personality was taken up into his Christianity. He was a whole hogger. So is Luther. Luther gets Paul, because Luther thinks like Paul. He's a whole hogger. So when Melanch or Erasmus is, 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 is shroffling, have you read how Luther, if, you know, he eviscerates him in, 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 in on the bondage of the will. I mean, it's devastating writing. Why? There's no patience with someone who's going to toy with the faith. None at all, dear or not. John Mark, who Paul at the end of his life says, get him and bring him. I find him useful for the ministry. I don't know about you, but I find that one of the most glorious passages 
in the book of Acts, or the Acts, the epistles, that, that the story in Acts isn't the end of the story, that Paul, in the end, welcomes him back. And that this young man, who was so given to riches, ended up, according to the church's tradition, being a martyr for Jesus. It's a beautiful thing. The true riches really did. They were what he finally himself for. Powerful. Yeah. Jeff, uh, take this question and your comments. Yesterday you talked about, or somebody said, well, we don't trust the law, we don't trust the gospel. Mm -hmm. I was thinking then, and I, and I think now, we don't trust God. So when God is using his law, we don't actually trust him to see it through. It's like we think we have to help him out. Right. We're, not, we're not patient to wait for him to call the person back. So we, we panic, and we're going to try well, to. Which is why the keys are gone. I mean, which is why almost no one in this room has ever used the, the binding key. Because we're afraid that it might backfire somehow. Do you guys ever hear Corby's lectures? Um, I mean, this, this, if, if you have not gotten a copy of that, um, was it at Tupelo where he did that or in Southern Illinois? It was Tupelo. Um, he gave these lectures and he tells a story. I mean, Corby basically said, I don't care what the, the Senate or any church says. You've been put into the office of the ministry and you have two keys. Use them. And, and, and so he had a lady in his congregation. This, she started, as he put it, shacking up with somebody who wasn't her husband. How did he deal with it? He said, don't you come to that altar. I bind this sin upon your neck. It will take you straight to hell. Repent. And she said, fine, I don't have to put up with your stuff. I'll go somewhere else. I'll receive the sacrament somewhere else. And he said, don't you do it. It'll be glass in your, in your mouth and in your stomach. You stay away from that sacrament. It will bring you damnation. The woman stormed out. And when she came back, however many years later, was it five? Something. It was a while. She finally came back and she said, Pastor, take it off me, please. Please forgive me. Please. And with joy, he absolved her and welcomed her to the sacrament. But he wasn't afraid to use the binding key. Again, he's one of these extraordinary individuals that God has blessed us with. It, have you ever noticed that there's sort of a commonality? All these really great men, they're, they're really great and they're kind of crazy. And they just didn't care because they were actually devoted to what God sent them to do. And that was, was going to shape their lives, period. Respectability never entered in. They did care. They cared, right, about what mattered. Well, what else yeah. does Jesus give us? What about he, he does indeed give us nothing else. And as we preach, we must, we must exercise them. But I mean, preaching is the public exercise of the keys every week, right? We need to preach in such a way that terrified sinners are consoled with the gospel and that complacent sinners are terrified. It, 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 and it's, is it easy to do? Walter said, oh no. It, it's something that, that the Holy Spirit himself has, has to teach us how to do in this school of experience. And uh, I know myself, well, Walter said of himself, he's still a learner. He said, I like to sit at the feet of Luther so that I can learn better how to do it. Uh, yeah. All right. I, I, I did want to get us to 2 Corinthians, if we could do that. 2 Corinthians 3. This is very much a part of what we were just talking about. Someone read for us the, you know, just the beginning verses, 1 to 3, nice and loudly. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need, as some do, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are a letter of recommendation written on our hearts be known and ready by all. And you show that you are a letter through Christ, delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Which immediately should call to your mind the new covenant in Jeremiah. Because there, I mean, I, I don't know what you're thinking when you hear, uh, I, I, I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. But he's not talking about writing it on their minds. He's not talking about implanting knowledge of right and wrong 
all people already have that from the fall. It can be obscured, it can be messed up, but it's still written in, in their hearts. Again, Walter in Law and Gospel, what does he say? Whenever you preach the law, you're preaching to them what their own conscience is preaching all the time. And it, I mean, it really comes down to this. Do, do you remember how you can grab the whole thing in a single passage? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Have you? This is the law. How do you want to be treated? This is all of love. It's brought down to that. I mean, you have, you have, Luther says, that takes all the Ten Commandments and puts it in something you can put in your back pocket. All the time, have it ready. You know, do as you would be done by. There, the, the, there's the law. But to write it on their hearts, that means more than you know the right from the wrong. It means you want the right. You want the will of God. You want what pleases God. That passage that we had from Romans that uh, uh, Von Schenk was talking about, Romans 7. When several of our friends became Orthodox, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, they were quite convinced about was that that passage is not talking about the Christian experience. Um, it's a description in their mind of what it's like not to be a Christian. The good, what I want to do, that I don't do. Do you see a problem with that? Isn't the very nature of being outside of Christ and in unbelief that you don't want to do the good. You are quite happy doing, I mean, you have one measure. What do I want? That's what pleases me. What God wants, what other people want. What I want, that's what matters. That's the nature of unbelief. The conflict only begins when God does the heart transplant. Do you remember how Ezekiel 36 talks about that? I'm going to take out of them the heart of stone and I'm going to put into them a heart of flesh. Bizarre. Kind of a strange word for that, isn't it? A heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in them, and I will make them do. The spirit himself inside will make them want to do. So when the law is written on the heart, he's talking about wanting from the inside, by the work of the spirit of God, to will with God. Um, this brings us to something that Personal pet peeve, when you speak, I hope that you do not tell the people of God, you don't have any free will. If you've ever told your people that, repent. <coughs> repent. The Lutheran confessions could not be clearer. Christians have a freed will, by which, in great weakness, they cooperate as the formula of Concord says, in all the works of the Spirit. When you talk to the baptized, you're not talking to people whose wills haven't been set free. You're talking to people whose wills are Roman 7 wills, wills that are in a conflict. How did Paul describe it in Galatians? Well, that's in Romans. What he said, but in Galatians, he, has, he uses a similar setup, and he says the, 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 the flesh versus the spirit. And so you have this, this huge conflict between the two, and these are opposed to one another, keeping us from doing what we would do. Um, I, I see some of you looking at you. A, a comment on I mean, this? Yeah. Say that one more time. Doubt is in effect proof of faith because it has to have something to be in conflict Ooh. with. Yeah, like, like that passage that passage in the Tractatus that says true worship of God is the exercise of faith wrestling with despair. Right? I mean, this is what divine service is. It's, it's faith wrestling with despair. Am I truly loved? Has he really given his life for me? This, this is what faith struggles to hold tight to question in itself is born of faith, so it's proof that God has fulfilled his promise to create faith in you at your baptism. 
I am sure that every one of you has told the person who comes to you worried about, I think I've committed the unforgivable sin. What have you told them? You're worried about it. You're worried about it. You don't need to worry about it. <laughs> because the people who have committed it don't care. Right? Yeah. Then, very good point. So Paul here describes the, the Corinthians. He's, and remember, it's in this, when you work through 2 Corinthians, this is the most emotive letter in the New Testament. And sometimes it, I, I really, I, I do suspect that we, we probably have a collision of, of texts there. Because it's really hard to figure out how he goes from talking about them in such kind, gentle terms to smacking them upside the face and, you know, and he just gets so upset with them. And then he's right back to tenderness and love. I really suspect we might have um, the, the so-called third letter that he references in, in the text itself. But be that as it may, here he's talking rather tenderly to them. And he says, you're the letter and you've been written on tablets of human hearts by the spirit of the living God. And then he says, Someone read for us these key words for the office of the ministry, four to six. Such confidence we have through Christ for God. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant. Not of the covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. All right. Our confidence we have is through Christ toward God, and he's really clear, we're not the origin of any piece of the confidence. As Dr. Nagel would say, if it has an aliquid in homine, it wobbles. If it has a place in man, it's not something you can be certain of, unless the man is Jesus. Our sufficiency as ministers is from God, and he's made us competent because he's given us this word of the new covenant, the new covenant, which is not of the letter, but of the spirit. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Again, you have to think yourself back into Jewish thinking about the Torah. When, when they celebrated Pentecost, do you remember what they celebrated with Pentecost? It doesn't work very well historically, but they did celebrate with the Pentecost a certain thing. The giving of the law. And what happened when the law was given? And Moses comes down and he finds them feasting. What does he say to the Levites? Who's on the Lord's side? Get over here. Get your swords. Every man against his brother. And how many die? They celebrating Pentecost and 3,000 die. As a Jew, that's how they would think, right? And then you come to the Feast of Pentecost and how many get in the water? 3,000 and live. I want to share with you how St. John Chrysostom, since we need to practice what we're preaching here, how did he actually exegete this, this text? He said, the letter kills. And by letter here, he means the law, which punishes them that transgress. But by spirit, the grace which, through baptism, gives life to those who by sins were made dead. In the law, he has sin is punished. But here, he that has sins comes and is baptized and is made righteous, and being made righteous lives, being delivered from the death of sin. The law, if it lay hold on a murderer, puts him to death. The gospel, if it lay hold on a murderer, enlightens and gives him life. And why do I instance a murderer? The law laid hold on one that gathered sticks on a Sabbath day and stoned him to death. Numbers 15. This is the meaning of the letter kills. But the gospel takes hold of thousands of homicides and robbers and baptizing them delivers them from their former vices. This is the meaning of 
the spirit gives life. The former makes its captive dead from being alive. The latter renders the man who has been convicted alive from being dead. For come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. And he said not, and I'll punish you, but I'll give you rest. In baptism, sins are buried. The former things blotted out. Man is made alive. The entire grace written on his heart as if it were a table. The entire grace written on his heart. The letter kills. But does the letter then have an ongoing role in your preaching? Said another way, is there something inside of you and inside of your hearers that needs to die? God only can save people in humility. And so the law has the constant role of keeping people humble. It always shows that they need mercy and forgiveness. And it does that not by telling them, I'm sorry, you need mercy and forgiveness. It does so by this terrifying act of holding the mirror to them that they might see who they are. And having seen who they are in themselves, always in themselves, then the mirror of the gospel that shows them, do not despair, because this is who you are in Christ. They won't know why they need this if this isn't constantly in front of them. And then you see on the gospel side that this ends up being a wonderful gift of salvation. If you didn't have that mirror of the law, Jesus standing up and saying, okay, so the one who is without sin among you, he gets to toss the stone first. If you don't have that, you'll never see the need to go stand with her and hear the word of absolution. Make sense? So we don't serve our people when we ignore the preaching of repentance, which is truly a preaching of terror. What does the word repent mean in Hebrew? Right. So this is so vivid, right? You're either walking toward God or you're walking away. You're either the prodigal son on the way out or the prodigal son on the way back. And conversion, what does it literally mean? To grab and turn. So, I mean, do, do you guys remember how this was enacted in the liturgy of baptism in the ancient church? This is so beautiful. You, they would have you face, I don't know where we are, east or west, I'm confused, we're in Indiana. So, is that west? That's east. That's east, that's west, okay. They would have you face west, and they would have you, do you renounce the devil and all his works and all his ways? Then you literally were picked up and turned to the east. Do you believe? I believe. It was a turning. And because we always have this old Adam in us that wants to turn back toward the darkness, the, the preaching of the law always is there to 
uh, to bring you to, to, to contrition and turn you back, to terrify you of where that way leads. Because that way does not lead home. It leads into that dreadful isolation, all alone, forever. Because that's what sin is at its heart. Sin is loneliness. Sin is saying to God, I don't want you as my father. I don't want what you have to give. I want my way. Turn around. Let's keep going. Seven. Someone read for us seven through, uh, I don't know, seven through 18. Let's just get that section. Now, if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came from such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of his glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it gift taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. For we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Mm. I love that entire section so much. He contrasts, he says, you know, it came with glory. What was the glory on Sinai? Presence of God. And there was a trumpet, and there was the cloud, and this, the, this rumbling presence of God. It had glory. And he says, ah, I ain't nothing compared to the glory that we see. But where was the glory that we see? Think out of John's Gospel. The cross. Here's the glory that we see. And this is a permanent glory. And, and if the other glory was terrifying, this glory, this glory is transformative. Because when the <coughs> veil is taken away, I love how the Lutheran Confessions deal with this in, in, in Apology 4 or Apology 5, however you count that, depending on what version of the Book of Concord you have. Um, the, the taking away of the veil isn't right away the seeing of Christ. It's actually hearing what the law really says. Because everybody, by nature, is the rich young ruler. And thinks, well, I've done that. It's no big deal. Right? And then Jesus... As, as Luther puts it, he out Moses is Moses. He takes the law in hand in the Sermon on the Mount and says, oh, well, you think you've done that, have you? Well, let's talk about that for a little bit. So, you haven't been around screwing with your neighbor's wife. Whoopee. God doesn't care about what you've done only, but about what you want. And he happens to have looked right down in your heart, and he saw what you wanted. Now, are you still going to tell me you haven't committed adultery? And he does that, of course, with all the commandments, right? But, you know, he shows how to read them. This is such a bad way of putting it. In a spiritual way, but what they meant with that is in the Spirit's way. The Spirit is taking the veil away so that you can actually see what the law demands. And what it demands goes all the way to the heart. And unless we deal with it in that way, we haven't preached the law. That's why, for example, don't, there are certain law topics that when you deal with them in the pulpit and the people walk out and say, Pastor, I 
am so glad you dealt with that today. There are people here who really needed to hear that. <laughs> Have you ever had it happen? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and what does that tell you right away? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't preach it in such a way that it went all the way down and all the way in. The veil still was on their eyes and they didn't see what was actually being demanded. Because see, it's only when they see what it actually demands that they can see what it actually looks like when it's fulfilled, right? Because when you see Christ, this is the life that lived it 100%. Go through the Ten Commandments. Is it not astonishing? Think about Commandment 3. He's the author of the Torah. He's the author of the Nabiim and the Ketuvim. And he sits there obediently listening and taking it in and treasuring it and loving it. He keeps it. In that astonishing moment. Do you remember? He didn't want to leave the temple. He's a teenager. And he didn't want to leave. If you ever doubted he was a real teenager, that story nails it for you. Because when he says to his mom, well, why were you worried? <laughs> Only a teenage boy would think he could go missing for three days and his mom wouldn't worry. And then, and then of course, he drops out with, didn't you know? Well, do you remember what she said to him? Son, what have you done? Your father and I have sought you sorrowing. And he comes back, already the sword piercing her heart. Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? He was in the temple, listening to the teachers of the law, of Torah, asking questions and answering and learning. He was doing his catechism and delighting in it. He kept the third commandment. And here's a human being who, unlike any of us, has never looked at another person as a sexual object. He could treat Mary Magdalene and all the others the way that he did because they were not objects. They were people, persons, sinners for whom he came. That made all the difference in the world in the way he He's the only person in the world who's ever done that. But he lifts his saints up to begin doing this by the power of the Spirit. Go through all the commandments. They work all the way. You haven't seen them all the way through till you've seen them perfectly fulfilled in his unbroken yes to the will of his Father. And when you see that, and see where that puts him, and see the moment of his glory, as to him, what is it to be the Pantocrat? What is it to have all authority and be ruling <coughs> over all things? It's to gather up the sins of all and to bleed over them all so that they may be forgiven. This is almighty power in the eyes of God. And when in your preaching you hold that up to the people, you've changed them. They are transformed into his image from one degree of glory to another. It's the way he works. Do you remember it was in Acts 2 when Peter preached you killed him. God raised him from the dead. What do the people cry out? It says they were cut to the heart and they cry out, what can we do? Isaiah 6. Isaiah doing the liturgy in the temple, not thinking much about it. And boom, <laughs> the veil is drawn back and all of a sudden he sees the reality behind the stuff that he's taken for granted all the time. And what does he cry out? I'm dead, I'm meat, I'm dead meat. I've seen the living God. You know, he's terrified. What about Luke 5? Jesus, there's Jesus sitting in the boat. And uh, <laughs> Peter having fished all night. And Jesus said, can I borrow your boat? Sure, you borrow our boat, sit there. You know, and they're cleaning their pater, pater tisman. That's the Ephesians forward. 
they're, they're, they're cleaning or mending their nets. And when they're done, of course, what does he say? Let's go, let's go dump them. You can see Peter. <laughs> Rabbi, I love you, but um, you know, we're the fishermen, you're not. Um, nevertheless, if you insist, and then they do, and then with all this bounty of gift, as though the Lord of the sea commanded every fish in the Sea of Galilee to jump into their nets and then fill their boats and start sinking them, what does Peter say? You, you don't want to be hanging around with me. I, I, I am a sinful man, O oh Lord. You do not want to be hanging around me. Go away. And as Isaiah got his living coal, Peter gets an invitation. What's he say to Peter? Not only am I not going away, you are coming with me. And I am going to make you be a fisher of man. You're going to start catching men, men alive. I love that, that actual expression there. You will catch men alive. That's the challenge. Summary. The truly preached law creates terrified consciences. And that constantly points out that in me, in my flesh, no good thing dwells. But the preached gospel sets consciences at peace again by the sacrifice of Christ in which we are wholly righteous and in which the sinfulness of our partially holy state is covered and forgiven. If you don't like the language of partially holy, tough. It's in the large catechism. Deal with it. <laughs> All right. Comments, questions, thoughts? Yeah. Um, how did you accomplish all the getting them to stew, so to speak, in 15 minutes? <laughs> A very important question that, 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 that needs to be addressed. How long should a sermon be? I confess that I was hoping that uh, tomorrow, I don't know how many of you are actually going to make it through to the end, but uh, tomorrow I was actually going to try to deal with the logistics of our sermons. But I'll say this. A sermon should be every bit as long as it needs to be and not one second longer. And it will depend entirely on the nature of the homily, the feast, and the people, how long it needs to be. But I mean, I look at Jesus with what people do until they came back. Right. Um, whether that was weeks, months. Yep. Yep. We've and and got to get long gospel bullets in that 15 And that's months. why I, I'm a big advocate of saying, don't build the bridge. D don't, don't try to go from the law to the gospel as though you, you just proclaim the law. The Holy Spirit will deal with it as he sees. And as, you, know, you may have people that walk out of there hardened by the law they hear. That's not your job. Your job is to speak that law. And the gospel that you speak, it may, it may come back to you three weeks later that the person's actually remembering and holding and hearing. Again, it's the Holy Spirit's job in the application of both. You have only the job of making sure you've spoken the humbling word and the non-despairing word, the hopeful word, the gospel word. Yeah. Time-wise, you can have really... I'm going to go to Dr. Nagel. I've heard him preach some of the shortest sermons I have ever heard in my life. And he got everything in there. And I still am in, I'm in amazement at how he could do it. Uh, I remember a homily that, you know, what was the law in that homily? The law in that homily was real clear. 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver to betray his master. What would it take for you? You should know. You've done it. Ouch! And, I mean, instant ouch! Um, yeah, Norman had, had the gift of, of doing some of these. And, and, and he could also have really long... The one I will never forget. He begins 
He begins it with Greek, which I don't normally think is, I did that yesterday too, but it's not something I normally would advise. But uh, it's at the seminary. He's, the catamantheno, which our Lord bids us do in today's gospel, is applied, uh, in, uh, the gospel is applied to the lilies of the field, is applied in the Septuagint to a dancing girl. Do not stare at the dancing girl, lest you be entranced in her wiles. And he says, and the dancing girl has something of the strumpet, trumpet lily in the way it thrusts itself at you. Okay, very different from the lilies of the field, scattered in extravagant profusion. I saw you in the whole, you do the whole sermon, it's, it's in my head. But his whole point was that, that, that uh, you know, pay attention, go to school with the lilies of the field and learn from them how to live simply from the Father's giving without worrying about tomorrow. No, you'll end up in the oven, it's okay. He ended up in the oven and he came out alive. You will too, fear not, you know? It's a fabulous homily. Um, and times I've heard in much longer, too. Um, I think in general, sermons used to be, probably it's still true in this room, that you old, the older gentlemen probably tended to preach longer than the younger ones, because the younger ones have had it hammered into them, think MTV or whatever. You know, it's got to be short, it's got to be punchy, it's got to be in and out of there. I don't necessarily believe that at all, but I do believe that a sermon should be as long as it takes and no longer. Um, I've graciously been invited to preach for Vespers, and I'm going to preach a very short homily. Um, I thought since we started out with Acts 1, we might as well continue with Acts 1. Um, but I want to just have it be a reflection on Mary. It's something I wrote about Mary a while ago. You might think I have a Mary obsession. I really don't. I love the mother of God. But uh, I think she can be a very powerful picture for preaching the gospel. And I want to use a way of preaching that's very different from expositing a text but that connects to a text. So you can tell me at, at dinner, that, 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 that didn't work, that was horrible, that's okay. Or you can tell me, yeah, I wasn't expecting that, but that actually works. I'd be curious how you actually think of, of how that goes. It'd be a very different approach. I don't think a homily needs to follow any kind of a formula. Um, you might find a formula that works really well for you. Old Testament to Gospel, and grace note on the epistle. Gerard Sloyan, in his little book on preaching, praises that method, and it does work. Works very well to get all three readings in. Um, Luther's, or the classic ancient church, just run through the text and comment on it. I know pastors who do that and do that well. Every once in a while, though, I think it does really well to throw something at them that they're not expecting. Do an entire sermon as a story. Um, you may even do something that doesn't work. Norman preached uh, seven last words on Good Friday. He had the Mary at the foot of the cross, you know, uh -huh. and, and, uh, he started out, he says, it, it, it was a funeral. There was a death impending there, and there should have been a great number of people in the family, but there was no, I don't think this is going to work. <laughs> <laughs> Honesty in the pulpit. There you go. Well, and how many of you, you have certainly had this happen, right? Where you're preaching and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit puts something into your head uh, and mind that goes in a totally different way than everything that's on the page in front of you. Do you run with it or do you not? Is that the Holy Spirit or is that Satan? <laughs> you know, which one is it? And, and you have to make that split second decision. Over the years, I learned mostly to trust it and to frequently run with it, and sometimes just scrapping everything that was there, and it's okay. It's okay. Um, also remember that no sermon has to do the whole job. Walter tries to make you think that every sermon has to bring a person to, to, to heaven. Remember, it's part of, it's a lifelong formation. You cannot fit the whole gospel into a single sermon. You do not need to. Um, but you do need to clearly present to them law and gospel. There needs to be and there is no more effective law than death. And, there, you know, and the gospel does not have to be vicarious satisfaction, although it certainly may be. Yeah. All right. We out of time? Four more minutes? Yeah. The reference in 2 uh, Corinthians 3 with your illustration of the two mirrors off the line in 1 Corinthians 13. Yeah. It could be. And, and I have to confess, one of my favorite 
mirror things is actually from, from Gerhard, uh, Johann, where, where he said Satan has mirrors that he plays with. <coughs> and when he's trying to lure you into sin, he uses the minimizing mirror. No big deal. Everybody does it. Don't worry. Go on. And then, after you've done it, he pulls out the maximizing mirror and says, Whoa, look at what you've done. There's no way that God could ever forgive someone for such an awful offense. You better despair. You're mine. And if you stop and think about your life, isn't that the way that he works in your conscience? It's no big deal. It's a big deal. You'll never be forgiven for that. Um, constantly, back and forth, back and forth. Um, I do like the idea of seeing now in a glass darkly, but then we're going to see face to face. I think, though, he even means now we even see the love of God in Christ on the cross in a way that we will, we will see it so much clearer in, in the kingdom. But our job is to help the people see it ever clearer. Yeah. Uh, I like what you said before about the free will. That's an important part of our confession, that kindness for Asians. I'm just wondering about how that translates into preaching, especially when you're talking about the, the conversion. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the man who's still facing west doesn't have the free will. He doesn't have the free will turn. But having been turned by the Spirit, the Spirit in him gives him the will to walk to the Father. Right. And he is willing with the Spirit. It's the same as the mystery of faith. Is faith a gift or is faith something you do? Well, yes! Um, you know, it doesn't take one bit away from it being a gift for it to be something that you, that you actually do. Um, yeah? Well, what I'm, what I'm wondering about is in terms of teaching to the back by like you were saying, that's that's different than preaching to Areopagus, right? Men, but, but in a sense, it, it isn't entirely different because those same people who have been baptized are called to return to their baptism, that they need to be converted. So, what does it actually look like in preaching to preach those people in such a way that they're not relying on anything in themselves but are actually being put to death for themselves? I think freedom of the will in our preaching should be, it's all solved by actually getting freedom straight. That freedom does not mean the power to do this or that. Freedom in the scriptures is to know yourself a child in the house of your father. I mean, John 8, right? We preach it every reformation. It's right there in front of us. The slave doesn't continue forever. The slave's not free. But but the son is free. And if the son sets you free, then you're free indeed. The prodigal son, he's not free when he's able to do whatever he wants. He's free when he's doing what the father wants. Freedom, I mean, uh, with all of our words, like, well, go back to quoting Norman one more time. If any word is in Christ, it becomes a new creation. And freedom taken into Christ does not mean being autonomous. It means being child of the Father. I mean, to me, that's just a, a massive difference between the two. And that really, I know we're out of time. One last recommendation that, oh, no, I did recommend it, didn't I? I, I recommended that book um, by, by John Paul, uh, uh, rather about the theology of John Paul. I, I really recommend it for this topic in particular, where he, he, he sort of traces the Eastern um, bifurcation of image and likeness that, that um, image is, is gift and likeness is task. Um, but the task is only possible out from living the gift. It's the living out of the gift. Freedom is what the Spirit gives us, and it only is possible to live it out by the gift given. And it's a gift we constantly receive. Make sense? Sure. All right. So we're on to best verse. Supper at 630.